Welcome to the RN to Writer Show. I'm your host, Elizabeth Haynes, RN. And I did build a six-figure writing business in pretty much my spare time. And today I teach other nurses and clinicians of all kinds, really, how to become freelance writers too. Because for one thing, the lifestyle of this is um, far superior to the chaos of clinical practice these days. You can follow us, by the way, on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and of course, YouTube. We are super excited today to welcome Dan Collins to the show. Dan is the Senior Director of Media Relations at Mercy Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland, serving as the downtown hospital's media liaison there since 1996. Dan is a former journalist, which I didn't know about you, with stints at the Washington Times and the Times Publishing Group and the Baltimore Examiner. And Dan oversees the Baltimore site for broadwayworld.com. That's like a dream gig. As lead theater reviewer and contributes articles to the Beacon newspaper. Dan served as a member of the affiliate faculty at Loyola University in Baltimore, where he taught an introductory public relations course for undergraduates for 11 years. He is the co-founder, secretary, and PR contact for the Chesapeake Fencing Club. I'm glad you're out there living my best life, Dan. (laughs) An actor in Baltimore Community Theater, having performed in such plays as Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh, Edward Albee's A Delicate Balance, and Yasmina Reza's God of Carnage, Dan is also a published playwright. Dan's a native of Baltimore, has also worked in city and state government, as the public information officer for the city of Thornton, the city of Thornton. I used, to, I used to live in Colorado Springs. Oh, really? Yes, I love Colorado. Now I'm down in Albuquerque, oh. but I, lo- I love Colorado. And Dan was also a public relations specialist for the Maryland State Highway Administration. He earned his BA from Loyola College and has a master's degree from Johns Hopkins University. Welcome aboard. I'm so excited. As I was saying to you before we came on, most of our audience uh, consists of nurses and other clinicians who didn't even know writing was a potential career path and they know nothing about the industry. And at our Into Writer, we actually offer a course called Passion Profit Prestige, How to Write Health Articles for Money which is about health reporting. And a key aspect aspect of health reporting is finding expert sources to interview. And that's where you come in as a media relations director. So can you tell us what your role entails and how people work with you? Um, Well, I am the liaison between um, Mercy, uh, our medical staff, Um, the various centers of excellence uh, and sort of the media of the world. And that's print, broadcast, internet, bloggers, local, regional, national, uh, occasionally even international. Um, And um, that's an interesting question though. You said, how do they find me? Um, Gee, it's it's something that it's relationships you build up over time. one way, of course, is uh, I subscribe to media query services, um, the, um, the Help a Reporter Out, the Harrow queries through Sijan and um, uh, the ProfNet queries. And so this is where reporters, journalists, and so forth, as I'm sure you're extremely well aware, post their requests for interviews. And so by working with writers that way, I've been able to develop relationships with writers all over. Um, so I'm either... Uh, responding to their requests. In fact, I got one just before this <laughs> taping began, uh, wanting to speak to a doctor about uh, omega-3s through fish oil. So it's like, okay, I'm trying to set that up. And then, oh, I'm running out of time. I've got to go through the podcast. <laughs> um, and um, uh, and also through, um, you do your own networking. And uh, there's, of course, you know, we have this wonderful social media world now, and the internet, you know, LinkedIn. Um, I'm up to like nearly 12,000 contacts on LinkedIn and most of them are media people. Um, and so I will reach out to them that way and they'll reach out to me and it all starts to feed on itself. You know, it takes time um, to 
but um, uh, so through all these different ways, um, it you, you start to get on people's radar. Um, uh, I've had writers contact me that I don't know at all, and I didn't try to reach out to them, but they'll say, I know you don't know me, but I spoke to so-and-so whom I know you worked with. And so they said you would be helpful on this. And so, you know, it, it all makes these connections and it's something you develop over time. It doesn't happen like, you know, this is my first day as a freelance writer. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're, you're not, not gonna suddenly have 5,000 contacts in, in the media. It, 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 it takes a little while to build that up. Exactly. And I think you make a, an excellent point that I want to jump on immediately about having, you know, 5,000 contacts. So first of all, I didn't tell the audience that part of the reason that you graciously agreed to be on the podcast, I believe, is because we worked together in the past. I was doing some reporting for health grades and I looked at this up and our, we first connected via ProfNet, which surprised me because I tend to go to major health system or hospital websites and just look for the media relations contact. Mm -hmm. That's how I would normally operate instead of putting a query out. Um, but anyway, I think that a lot of novice nurse writers don't realize that making connections with people like you is sort of a... Um, I don't want to say shortcut because that sounds sketchy, but it's an efficiency thing because then when you need a source, you can reach out to your one of the contacts in your list like you, like I worked with you multiple times over the years to source experts to interview for my articles. So all of you who are listening should definitely now put Dan on your list for getting started <laughs> for sure. And then build up from there. Um, but I did want to dispel this myth that for example, once you have worked with a media relations liaison, or even once you have worked with an expert, you've interviewed a nurse practitioner or a physician, it doesn't mean you can't interview them again if, you, if it makes sense for a story you're working on, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, a lot also kind of depends on the, um... The, uh, the editor that maybe the writer is reporting to. I mean, I can think of one writer that immediately springs to mind who writes for Reuters Health. And I help her out uh, fairly often um, where she's looking for doctors to comment on uh, new studies that are about, that are embargoed about to come out. And I remember uh, um, I had helped her with a story and then I saw that she had posted on ProfNet looking for doctors for another study that I said, oh, that's an interesting study. I think I could help her with that. But she said, oh, her editor said, you, you know, you just worked with this institution, got to go get somebody else. So it's like, okay, that's cool. Then I know that for her and for, you know, what she's working on, I got to space it out a little bit more, you know, if, if I'm going to, or, and she knows that too for me, that she's not going to come to me directly. But, you know, it really depends on the writer. It depends on that writer and their editor. Uh, and, um, but, you know, I can think of yet on the other end of the spectrum, uh, a certain national freelancer that writes for like a dozen different types of publications, you know, all sorts of from, from the mundane to the, to the um, mainstream. And I, I hear from her, I think almost every week and, you know, and she'll use the same doctor from me again and again and again and again, you know, it's, it's like, as long as I can get that quote, as long as I can get that information, she's happy. And it's like, Hey, works for me. You know, it's like anything I can do to get my doctor out there and get that link. You know, that's the thing is that, you know, if, if you really want to impress all you projective freelance writers out there, you know, if you really want to impress the PR people that you're working with, um, make sure that, you know, when you quote that source, if it is all possible, because I know sometimes it's out of the writer's control, but if it's all possible, give that link back to them because that's what it's all about. I mean, that's kind of why we're doing this so that we'll drive people to our site and that they'll learn about our doctor and our institution and, and so forth. So, um, but to answer your question in my typical, very, very long winded ongoing rambling way, uh, yes, um, you can definitely come back to a source of multiple times. Well, I'm long winded and rambling too. So, um, uh, we're, we're not going to concern ourselves with that. We're going to concern ourselves <laughs> with the content of what we're saying. Uh, I, I agree with you that it, whether or not you can reuse sources always comes down to the editor's call. 
And the same thing with like including the link, like I've had to go back to uh, PR people and say, you know, that I put the link in and it got stripped out and, you know, I, I'm just the writer. This is when I rely on the, just the writer thing uh, because so much of that is out of our hands, but I think it's great for our audience to understand that the, the motivation behind why you can hook us up with experts is because yes, you're trying to get publicity for your institution. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's how all of this works. We need an expert who can illuminate a subject for the audience we're writing for. And if that means that in turn, we mention the institution they work for, that's a very acceptable and ethical quid pro quo, right? Uh, that's again, just how it's done in, in journalism, particularly, Absolutely. but then again, there are editors who don't want to go too far in terms of, they are willing to mention, for example, the institution, but not put a link, or if you just wrote a book, they might not be willing to mention your book or, you know, whatever. And sometimes that's not up to us. So the message for the audience is check with your editor, find out what sources are acceptable and what you can offer you can never promise a mention and i've had sources get cut too and that's a painful conversation sometimes with a, a person like you to say man that was a great interview and then guess what they assigned me 1500 words decided they wanted a 500 word front of book instead <laughs> it's all gone <laughs> all the good quotes are gone uh, but then we can come back later and get quotes from one of your sources again sure. so that's good Absolutely. um so when um, a brand new freelancer has just gotten an assignment and they, they want to interview an expert, so they come to you, they reach out to you, in your specific case, do you have a preferred way of somebody reaching out, whether it's email or LinkedIn? And secondly, what information should the writer give to you to start this conversation? Mm -hmm. Um, well, if this is a brand, as you say, a brand new writer, someone I've never dealt with before, um, the type of information I'm looking for is, well, who are you writing for? You know, what's the outlet? Um, what's the topic? Um, and I can get as many specifics as I can. In other words, if the person says, well, I'm doing a story about hip replacement. Well, that's a pretty broad topic. <laughs> you know, it's like hip replacement relevant to what? Um, so more specific, the better. Uh, and if it's possible to, you know, do they have a sense of what questions they want to ask? In other words, the more that I can know up front what the story is really about, what kind of information they're really looking for, that's going to be helpful because, it, it, you know, when you have a diverse clinical staff, you know, um, if I know more specifically what they're looking for, it really helps me connect them to the source that's really going to be best for them to get the information that they want. So, you know, cause we have a lot of orthopedic surgeons but they all have different types of specialties. This doctor is better for knee, this one's better for hip. This one also has a sports medicine background. So it all kind of depends on, you know, knowing that. So I want to find that out. Um, and uh, I guess really, and of course the big question always is what's the deadline? It's like so many times I get contacted by writers and they said, we're doing the story and blah, blah, blah. And I said, sounds great but they don't tell me when they need it by. And that's huge. <laughs> you know, so I have to like, to me, that's like, you know, journalism 101, you know, it's like, we need to know when do you need it by? Well, I need it by this Thursday. Oh, I need it before five o'clock. Oh, I've got some time on this one, whatever it is, because that helps enormously again, in terms of, you know, if, if you're a nurse and you're, or you're a clinician of some sort and you're a freelancer, you know, that, generally, you don't have a lot of time. <laughs> you know, we're, we're a practicing hospital. We're not a academic thing where you've got doctors who are just doing research and not actually seeing patients. So our folks are all seeing patients. So, you know, if, if I know that they have a full week, well, that greatly enhances my chances that I can help them versus like, well, I need it in the next 15 minutes. Well, that's going to be harder, but maybe I might know somebody who can do it in the next 15 minutes, but I'm not going to know who that person is unless you, they tell me. So all these things I want to know about, uh, and I might, you know, again, this is, I'm fortunate to have some resources 
So, you know, we use decision system. So if it's like, I could do a search on this person, I can do a search on their outlet if I've never heard of it before. Of course, it's like, I'm writing for the Wall Street Journal. Well, I've heard of them. So it's like, okay, I know who they are. But if it's like, I'm doing it for the such and such, such and such site, it's like, I don't know what I want that. So I got to go look that up and make sure, is that kosher? You know, is that like, you know, um, you know, like, oh, I see half their stories are about abortion. Well, we're a Catholic institution, so we're probably going to pass on that. So all that stuff, it's, it's just like what you would imagine. I always say a lot of what we do in PR is just common sense. Do your reconnaissance. So the more information that the reporter can provide me up front about who they are, who they represent, what their story really is, what their questions are, what type of sources that they're looking for, um, uh, what their deadline is, how they want to do the interview. Um, is this by phone? Is this an email? Um, I've noticed, for example, um, it really does vary writer to writer. Uh, again, I was just talking to before this interview um, where the, uh, the source that I had in mind only does phoners because she was in a terrible car accident. She's had nerve damage in her arm and so any writing beyond the minimum she needs to do for her practice, she doesn't want to do any typing. So she only does phoners. So I said, oh, do you do phoners? She said, well, it's like, um, you know, we prefer the emails because of accuracy. They want to make sure, but we do voice recordings. So I said, oh, okay, that's different. So I said, well, I mean, it's essentially like still doing a phone, you're just recording the, the phone interviews. I said, oh, well, okay. So, you know, learning that. Um, Because again, that makes a difference. Or it's like, no, it absolutely has to be an email response. Then I know this doctor I was thinking of can't do it. So that sounds like a lot. And it may say, do I have to know all these things? But, you know, it's like anything. seems a lot up front. But once you start doing it, it becomes automatic. You know, you you know that. And it's, you know, so if we're communicating, um, there's no reason why, you know, we can't work it out and I can provide what they need and I can get what I need. I think what I heard there was basically revert to the five W's, who you're writing for, what exactly you're writing about, you know, who the audience is, why you're writing it, when is the deadline. And I think for the audience too, they need to remember that in your job, you field lots of inquiries. And some of these are journalists for national outlets who need it today like they are on deadline they're going on camera for example at 5 12 p.m eastern time and they have to have this done before then and so that deadline is crucial like you said for you um to know and what i would say for the audience is um and dan can cover his ears never give your final deadline to a publicist (laughs) or a source or anyone else, you need to pad that because things happen, interviews fall through, people fail to show up and you have to have time. You don't wanna say, I'm turning in my article on the 15th and so I need it by that morning. You know, it's better if you have time to say, I need that by the 13th. And then you can, you know, you can adjust if something happens. Uh, Somebody could be in a car accident and not be able to do the interview, for example. Another point that I want to make for the audience that comes up a lot in questions is, can I reveal the outlet? And I always tell people, don't be cagey. Um, If you have any doubts about whether you can reveal to a public relations or a media relations person, if you have any doubts about whether you can reveal the outlet you're writing for, first of all, ask your editor, but there should be no question about that. Uh, They're going to be published in this, in this, place. So you need to reveal that. Um, We're not, nurses especially, you know, we're very coached up on confidentiality. And so that's why that's more of a concern, I think, for this audience is I'm not sure how much to divulge because we're taught not to divulge much about anything. Well, Um, well, I was just going to say one reason that I think that happens, because I used to wonder, like, why why are they not telling me or why why is this like query listed as anonymous? They don't want to say what the outlet is, is there there is sometimes the concern from the writer's point of view that the PR person is going to try to do an end run around them and contact the publication directly and try to do whatever 
they want to do with that. And so they want to try to hold some amount of control over that. And I understand that. But to me, I, I think, you know, it, it's really why I say you have to build that relationship. You have to get to know who this PR person is. I don't do that. I don't have time to do it either. And it's like, I don't have time to be like, you know, contacting some website or, you know, or contacting a, a newspaper and, you know, and it, well, how's that going to help me? And it's like, it, it doesn't really work for me. So um, I, I think you're absolutely right. Everybody should be as upfront as, as you can possibly be. And one way I avoid it is that if, if, if they're not going to give me the source, you know, what the publication or outlet is, um, I, I pass. You know, you know, if it's an anonymous query, I don't even bother. I just pass because, again, I can't take the risk. Mercy's a Catholic institution. It's a little different with other hospitals. So, you know, I can, oh, I didn't realize this was for Planned Parenthood newsletter. You know, that's that's not going to go over well, you know. So um, I, I have to be mindful of that. Maybe some other institutions, it doesn't matter quite so much. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I, I think it's it's, again, when that trust is there, if the reporter is comfortable with the PR person that they feel like, yeah, I can tell you, you know, it's, it's not an issue. Um, but then I think, you know, it's fine. I, I think that's a good point about um, PR professionals doing an, an end run. But in my experience, that's more, um, more of a potential with private PR professionals who have private clients and less so with yeah. media relations people who work for an institution yeah. like you. I've never had that concern with you guys because that's not in your best interest. Like you said, this is all, it's a relationship industry. And that's something I also constantly emphasize in our courses and coaching is when you're coming into health reporting or even content writing, it seems vast and unknown because you are new to it. But in reality, it's a fairly small world where you get to know people and develop relationships. And that's how this industry works, you know, and makes your life easier too as a writer. Um, I find it interesting. Of course, I knew that you would vet potential outlets before participating um, with the, the writer. And I think that's really good for nurses to know. I think also though, it's good to know that if they're, as a freelancer, we write for many outlets. And just because maybe one outlet doesn't hit with Mercy Medical, that that doesn't mean that person couldn't come back to you for a different outlet, correct? Correct, mm-hmm. Yeah. So and that, a lot of, I was going to say a lot of the freelancers I work with, and I mentioned one already, and you know, uh, the national writer uh, that I mentioned, um, uh, do write from multiple outlets. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like, well, that outlet, eh, not so much, but this one, oh yeah, sure. So again, and again, that's that's it depends on the writer and, and it mm -hmm. depends on the opportunity. Let me shift gears a little bit and ask you this. I hope this doesn't sort of put you on the spot. I don't think so, because every person in your type of industry that I've known is very agile. Um, when it comes to actually interviewing the subject matter expert that you're providing, what kind of gaffes can writers make that would incline you not to work with them again? Hmm. Well, let's see types of gaps. Well, I mean, if, for example, if the, the doctor was identified as being with the wrong institution, <laughs> which has happened, <laughs> uh, I could think of one where they were identified as being with Johns Hopkins when they were most definitely not with Johns Hopkins. Uh, that cons would concern me. Um, usually it's, it's maybe feedback I'll get from the doctor themselves of saying that, oh, what they said here was completely wrong. You know, I didn't say this or it was inaccurate. And, and usually I'll just go back to the writer and say, you know, well, let, well let's look at this one particular thing that, that's off. And I haven't really had a whole lot of, I mean, I can count on a fifth of a hand how many writers I've had to cut out and say, I, I can't work with you. Um, you, I mean, it's, it, it just doesn't happen very often. That's good to know. I, you know, I was thinking things like, 
blowing off the interview, for example. Um, you know, I'm sure you're aware in, in freelance writing, we're, we're somewhat afflicted with people who don't take it seriously as a job. So that, you know, they can blow deadlines and blow off interviews. I would think that would be a reason not to work with someone. I'm happy to know that there, that you haven't really encountered any gross unprofessionalism inside an interview that a, a physician or some other SME has come back to you with, because that would be pretty egregious too. just uh, I don't know, getting off track or discussing inappropriate topics or flirting or something crazy um, like that. I don't know. No, I, I, I'm, I've been, you know, knock wood. I haven't had any, any, anything egregious of, of that sort happen. So uh, I guess I'm, I'm living a good life. <laughs> or there's just a lot of good reporters out there. That's what I like to think. Yes. yes. Well, you know, definitely. Um, and, and, through these sources that we've mentioned uh, several times, not that we're doing advertising for ProfNet and Harrow, um, I'm, they do their own vetting so that, you know, you don't get, you know, so if, if in other words, if they're, if the writers are coming from these sources, I already feel good about them going in because, you know, they've kind of been pre-vetted to a certain degree. Um, but, you um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really haven't had that. I haven't uh, had writers. What I what occasionally will happen is I'll set up an interview and then the writer will contact me and say, oh, my editor, you know, has now like moved this story back like three months. And so now we're not going to do the interview now. And it's like, well, that's fine. I get it. You know, so it's like, sure. All right. Well, I'll put a note on my calendar, follow up with, you know, this writer in three months, you know, and then, then we'll do the interview. But I haven't had a thing where like, eh, I just, you know, blew it off because I just didn't feel like writing the story. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't encountered that. Well, that's good to know. I, uh, I personally have to say, I always, uh, well, let me back up. I'm extremely introverted and shy, actually. And so doing interviews to me was always very nerve wracking, having to interact with someone I don't know, and somebody who is a real brainiac. I mean, I have had the privilege of interviewing some truly brilliant medical providers, um, but that's also so rewarding. If you can set aside that anxiety and just focus on them and, you know, ask your questions. And I, we were talking earlier about, for example, email versus phoners. I always liked phoners better, even though I have a real aversion to the telephone, because you get to go off on these tangents. Um, you know, that they will say something that ignites a question that you, you wouldn't have thought to ask, you know, proactively in an email interview. And I think for nurses in particular, that's a real missed opportunity then when you're not verbally interviewing someone because we have often, we have worked side by side in the same milieu. Um, an example that I've used many times is I interviewed an orthopedic surgeon one time when PRP was just coming out. And during the interview, I said to him, and I had used it in a plastic surgery setting myself, but I wasn't sure if it worked the same in orthopedics. And in the interview, I said to him, so this is fascinating to me now do you all spin it down right in the OR? And he stopped and there was this pause and he said, are you a nurse? And I said, yes. And he said, because no one would think to ask me that. No one would know if you had never been in an OR, who would, you know? And those are the kind of nuggets that nurses and other clinicians can get out of an interview for their editor or their client that elevate their content or their article. So I always advocate for us to do phoners. Now it's Zoom, but, you know, uh, do it in person so you can explore all those little tangents. And I think it also helps the source. It can really elevate the source to look like even more of an expert in a way, you know. Well, well, generally I found, I, I find most doctors and nurses or really any practicing clinicians prefer phoners because not a lot of people like to write. Um, and also that means they have to take the time to sit down at the keyboard and type out answers. 
and they don't want to do that. You know, they don't mind like, I'll pick up the phone. Yeah, talk about, yeah, then I can speak, talk, 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 boom, I'm done. They don't have to worry about it. Um, and there are certain sources that I use here at, at Mercy who have made it very clear that they will only do phoners. Um, however, there are also others that, you know, are the opposite. It's like, you know, no, I want it to be accurate. It has to be email. So, you know, it's, it's always trying to juggle this out between what the writer wants and what my source can do and then trying to match, okay, it has to be a phoner from the writer's point of view, but the, you know, my doc wants to write it out. So, okay, well, that I maybe need to get a different doc, you know, so you always find a way. I mean, that's, that's the key is, Again, if I'm a freelancer, getting to know those PR people who find a way, you know, which are the ones that come through versus the one that's like, well, I tried one and that was it and I'm done. You know, it's like me, I'll, I'll the phrase I've heard about myself is, fans like a dog with a bone, you know, it's like, which is like, well, I, uh, okay, uh, you know, what kind of dog am I talking about here? Um, but anyway, it's like, but point is that I'm not going to give up. I'm going to find, okay, well, that didn't work. So let's try this other source. So let's try this. Or what can we do to make this work so that, you know, we, we, we get that placement, we get that link and the story gets done and everybody's happy. You know, so that's, you know, if I don't do that, then I feel I failed. And it's a, it, failure is not an option, you know, so, you know, um, so that's part of your job also as a freelancer is getting to know your contacts, you know, who's the, you know, PR person who's maybe they're quick to respond to you, but they don't follow through that well, or the one that they're a little slow to get back to me, but they always deliver, you know, so you'll start to create a list of, you know, who, who's my in case of emergency break glass. Now, I have come to learn over the years that I'm definitely a lot of writers in case of emergency break glass person, you know, so you know, and not sometimes like, well, I wish they would like contact me when it's not like they need it in the next 15 minutes all the time, you know, but it's like once you've got that reputation because you've come through, you know, and well, okay, that's fine, you know. So again, from the writer's perspective, know your, not just know the sources, like this doctor is great to talk to or this nurse is great to talk to, but know your PR people, you know, who is the one that's, who gets it done, you know, for what you need. Um, and, you know, over time, you'll create that list. And, you know, and that's great, because that's how, you know, like, we developed a relationship, and I, it worked out well. <laughs> exactly. Yes, for sure. It made my life so much easier, you know, and I think that's, especially in this day and age, to try and make a living as a freelancer, it's all about efficiency. And so anything that makes your life more efficient, in terms of the writing is good. You know, I mean, it's beneficial. Let's explore one more topic real quick and then we'll wrap this up. And that is what, what are your expectations in terms of following up after the interview? For example, it always, always comes up to my source wants to review the quotes or my source wants to see the piece. And now you have a journalism background. So I'm interested to hear your take and your expectations when working with freelancers in terms of that follow-up after the fact? Well, um, it really kind of, well, one thing that that's, uh, that plays a role is the source of set them up. I mean, I can think of one particular doctor who really wants to see the quotes ahead of time because she's just has very strong concerns about that. That's fine. Um, and, you know, in that case, I will communicate that to the writer that, you know, this doctor is a great source, but they're going to want to see, you know, like for fact checking purposes. And a lot of writers actually will, will sort of jump the gun with me and say that, oh, you know, uh, you'll get to see this before it runs, you know, so, oh, great. Okay. I didn't even ask for that. And they're going to let me see it. So that's fine too. But again, it depends on the source. Um, but generally, you know, the main thing I want to find out is like, once I set the interview up, um, I just want to make sure I'll usually follow up the writer and say, you know, did you get everything that you needed? Did, did my, you know, doc come through the way I thought they were going to come through? I've got, I mean, I'm a one man band here, you know, oh, wow. um, there's like, it's like, you know, my staff of me, myself and I, 
I don't have the time to sit in on every single interview or, you know, very few of the interviews. I, 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 uh, because it's, again, I know my doc, I know my source, I don't need to be there. So, you know, and if there is an issue, the, the, if it's an issue uh, with the doc that they didn't like the writer, they let me know. And then I find out what the problem is and I'll go back and vice versa. If the, the, the uh, writer says, you know, this doc really didn't know a lot about such and such. And it's like, oh, I feel bad. Okay, um, what can I do to help fix that? You know, can I find another source for you? Or if it's like, there really isn't anyone else, but maybe there's someone outside of our institution, you know, uh, that can help you. You know, so because I work a lot with the Maryland Hospital Association and I will like sometimes contact them and say, I have this, you know, uh, writer here is doing a story about A, B and C. My doc really wasn't able to give her quite what she wanted. Could you send out an APB to all my other PIOs for all my all the other hospitals in the area that maybe they can find someone for them? Because the bottom line is I want to make sure that the writer gets what they needed and, you know, it's kind of like being in sales. You know, you just want to make sure the customer, which in this case is the writer, you know, got what they wanted. And even if it means they got it from somebody outside of this institution, you know, they'll still remember that they had a positive experience in our store, as it were, so that they'll want to come back and be a repeat customer and work with us again. So, you know, all that is coming into play. Well, all media relations people should have that approach. It's much appreciated from our side, I can tell you that. Well, let me just say one thing about that real quick, is a lot of times I think uh, the media doesn't realize that PR people are all, it depends on the, where they work, may be being forced to do things and say things and ask things that they really don't want to, like, you know, I have to see the article in advance or you have to write about this because they've got people above them who don't understand the process, who think of the media as sort of an extension of their marketing office that, you know, they, they have to do that. Um, see, this is why I'm very lucky. I've been in the business long enough that I was able to get a job. I could pick where I wanted to work. So I'm in an institution that understands the process and I don't have to worry about powers that be saying, you've got to, you know, it's got to say this and they have to write that or whatever. It's like, they, I, I, I'm, I'm left to do PR the way I want to do it. And I think most competent, ethical PR people want to do this job the same way I do it. But they're not all as lucky as I am to work for a place like Mercy Medical Center. So, you know, that's why actually it's very funny because just before this, I did a chat uh, with a lady who's, um, uh, she's an MFA candidate in creative writing in college. She wants to get into this field of PR. And um, I was trying to make this, you know, very point that, you know, be careful who you go to work for, you know, are they going to have the same mindset, ethics, uh, approach to the business that, you know, fits you because you might say, oh, great, I got this job. And then you get there and it's like, they want me to do what? You know, they want me to say what? You know, like the media isn't going to, you know, I always say that the, the, you can't shove an apple down the media's throat when they've asked for an orange. All you're going to do is tick them off and they're not going to want to work with you. So my philosophy is like, you come to me, say, Dan, I need an apple. I know I need to sell these oranges. I'm going to find you the apple, even if I have to pluck it from another tree, if you know what I mean. Here's that apple. And as you're walking out of the store, I'll say, you know, maybe next time you come around, you might want to consider this orange. And that's what it's all about. So ultimately, I'm still getting that orange sold, but I'm doing it in a way that you got what you needed. You didn't feel like I violated some, you know, ethical standard here by trying to shove something down your throat that you didn't want. Nobody wants the pushy salesperson when you go to the store, you know, it's, it's the same mindset. Yeah. There's, um, unfortunately there are some PR, I would say firms and individual publicists who do think that by connecting you with the source, they get to dictate the story right. that you're doing. And, right. 
it can create a lot of conflict and it can create actually a lot of anguish for the writer because the writer is then caught in, in the middle of that. And like you said, um, we'll never work with that publicist again for putting them in that position because in that respect, we are just the writer. We've been tasked by an editor to create an article to their specifications. We're not, we don't have the power to change that because of what a publicist might want. And I was going to say also, this is what I always tell novice freelance writers about the issue of, I interviewed this source and now they're saying that uh, they need to review the whole article or, or else I have to take them out or whatever, whatever. You can avoid a lot of that kind of nonsense. And to me, that's all nonsense by establishing with your editor before you line up sources, what is the publication's policy? Do, they, do you want me to run their quotes only past them for fact checking? That's becoming very common today. And personally, I think that's fine because we all want the quotes accurate, but can I run the entire article by them? No, not if you're working for a real, journalistic outlet. No, that is not how we do journalism. And sometimes an editor, I've had editors at legitimate outlets say, you can include a line or two around the quote to, to show the context so that they're not upset about the context. But um, anyway, this has been a fascinating um, interview, Dan. I really appreciate, again, your coming on. I think we need to do this again next year or something and answer Absolutely. more questions. Um, again, I've been talking today with uh, Dan Collins, who's the Senior Director of Media Relations at Mercy Medical Center in Baltimore. I am Elizabeth Haynes, your host with RN to Writer. I'd like to thank uh, Dan for being on and I'd like to thank the audience for listening. You can subscribe to us I guess I always say that wrong. The correct terminology is you can follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and you can subscribe to us on YouTube, which I think is the preferred way to do this is to watch the video of the interview. So anyway, thank you all for listening. And until next time, keep pitching.